So today what we're going to talk about a little bit is, is what we're titling Sheltering Under the Leopard's Umbrella. Um, it's a bit two-pronged. Uh, the leopards in the central highlands of the country have, have been in the news a fair bit recently, in the last couple of years, last few years, um, but not a lot of information has been, has been gathered about them. And so we're going to pre present data and some results from the last couple of years of working in the central highlands. Um, with a specific emphasis on, on sort of a new approach that we're, we've de we've, we're deciding to take of uh, looking at the leopard as sort of an umbrella species for the conservation of wider biodiversity in Sri Lanka. So that's kind of how the talk's gonna, gonna go. And hopefully we'll be able to show some sort of relatively new information to people. So initially, when we're talking about biodiversity conservation, um, basic question is, what, what's the real value of biodiversity? We hear a lot about it. We know it's sort of, generally speaking, what it means, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> however, what is, the, what is the real value of biodiversity? So in terms of, thanks, in terms of uh, ecosystems, biodiversity has two real important noticeable values. One is for the resilience of that system. So the more biodiverse you have a system, the more species that are part are enmeshed within that ecosystem, um, the better able that system is to withstand perturbations from outside, um, whether they be natural or disease or whatever it happens to be. So if something comes in and knocks out a, a given species within a larger system, if there's something else that's there that can step in and fulfill that same function, you have increased stability within the system. So it, it, it provides stability to an ecosystem. Uh, additionally, um, biodiverse systems are much more productive. So productivity in this case, we, we're, we're meaning things like uh, nutrient cycling, like uh, you know, improved um, function for water, uh, uh, the water cycle. So these are ecosystem functions. And so these are essential, uh, obviously, for, for human existence. Um, but of course, these days everything has to be valued monetarily, and so there's been efforts to do that, to, uh, to put a value on the goods and services that we get from uh, functioning ecosystems. I'm not necessarily a big proponent of this, but I understand why it's done, because obviously these days the bottom line is something that everyone sort of, I guess, gets uh, on the same page about. So if you look at the, the value of the goods and services that's been estimated as coming from ecosystem services over the past, for in, in a given year, it's about $33 trillion. Now that doesn't mean much to anybody, it's a huge number. If you put it in a bit more context, it's basically, in, it's about basically double the goods and service production of humans. Um, putting all that aside, the point is without a functioning ecosystems, people can't survive on the planet. And, Increased biodiversity is an integral part of uh, properly functioning systems. So the problem is, of course, that we're experiencing rapid biodiversity loss. So we're in the midst of what has been termed the Anthropocene, uh, which is a new era, um, which is dominated by humans and human activities and the results of human activities. And unfortunately, the results of human activities all too often uh, are negative, Im negative impacts on other species. So. It's estimated that current rate of extinction of other species, for instance, is 1,000 to 10,000 times um, the, the normal background rate. Of course, getting the normal background rate is difficult, but an indication that, that, that extinctions are happening quickly. Um, that figure that you see up on the, on the screen shows some different uh, continents in the world, and where the black arrow comes in at the bottom indicates where humans arrived on the scene. This is looking at uh, large mammal species uh, survival. And as you can see, immediately to the right of those, uh, those arrows when humans arrive on the scene, you, def you typically see a, a dramatic decrease in uh, survival of these large mammals. And that's, that happens sort of again and again. These, are th th these kind of graphs you see repeatedly for a different, spe different taxa. Um, so it's just giving a, an indication of the, the strong impact that humans have. It's estimated that humans are about 0.01% of the biomass on the planet, but have been responsible for about 83% of uh, of extinctions that are known. Um, put that into numbers a little bit, uh, we can see that you know there's been some 870 known species that have gone extinct over human, hum that humans have been aware of, including six in 2017, uh, 1,700 critically endangered species, 26,000 or so that are, that are threatened by endangerment, including one in four mammals, um, one in eight birds. Uh, you can see the numbers up there. So basically, we're experiencing biodiversity loss at a tremendous rate. So we've seen that it's important. We see, we've seen that we're losing it. So what do we do about it? Well, typically, when you have a problem, um, you need 
to have the information at hand in order to address it you know, effectively. So the information we would need in this context is sort of an increased catalog of the species, what's out there, you know. Um, we need to really know what's out there, we need to know its function, and we typically need resources in order to do this. The problem is we typically don't have, we don't have the necessary information, we don't have sufficient resources, uh, conservation resources. So typically what happens when you don't have these things is you get a little bit bogged down. However, we also don't have time to get the full amount of information that we require. To get, you know, a full picture of what we really need to do most effectively would take too long. Things are happening now, species are going extinct at the moment, populations are declining now, habitat loss is happening rapidly. So, as a result, we need to prioritize conservation actions. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit um, today. So there's a couple of key uh, valuations, conservation valuations, when it comes to, uh, to, to species. Um, so one of those is, is the value, uh, the flagship value of the species. These are typically large, charismatic, um, attractive, awe-inspiring, you know, um, species, like the, the ones that are seen on the screen there, that they attra attract the public's imagination and the public's attention, and people are interested enough in them that they will uh, they, will, they will rally to support these species. Now these are also the species a lot of scientists kind of end up rolling their eyes at a little bit because they, they obscure some of the smaller, more, you know, very important species that don't get any of the attention or the funding. However, we can sort of use that from a conservation perspective to utilize these species to draw in public support and hopefully uh, conservation funding and then spread that around to include a lot of the, the, the less charismatic species that are of a vital importance but don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve. Now, a second important uh, concept is that of the umbrella species. Now, this is less to do with the iconic stat status of the species, which is what you get with the charismatic uh, big species. This is to do with wide-ranging species, so like er uh, species that cover a lot of, of areas. So they're typically large. Um, and the idea is that for, to, to maintain viable populations of some of these large animals, you need a lot of space. So in order to conserve that space to ensure the long-term viability, you will by default be protecting areas that are inhabited by a host of smaller species that are more spatially restricted. So it's kind of a, a way to try and efficiently uh, go about conservation. Um, so that's what it's going to be the main focus of, of uh, what we're talking about today. Um, now, it, this leads us to apex predators. Apex predators typically fulfill both a flagship and um, an umbrella role, a flagship role because they're typically attractive, they're, humans have a strong link with these large carnivores from you know, historic times. Um, and in addition, because of their social structure, often they're territorial um, and therefore they live at lower densities than a lot of gregarious species that live in groups, so therefore they typically need a lot of space, so they fulfill that umbrella function fairly well as well, or can. Um, and a third aspect, which is of importance, which is an ecological value of these species, is their keystone status. So therefore, that means that they're, it, they, they basically are more important to the system in which they are in than their numbers alone would indicate. So if you can see on the, on the right or the left, depending on which screen you're looking at, um, that's illustrated nicely by this, uh, by this archway. I mean, the keystone is an architectural term from that central stone in an archway, and if you remove that stone, the archway potentially crumbles. Um, in, this, in this illustration, it's a salmon. This is a North American uh, example. And so the idea being that if that salmon is removed from the system, there's a great amount of instability that would result in that system. Now, one of the things that's interesting with keystone species, it's very difficult to determine with certainty which ones are keystone and which ones aren't. So I was looking up the illustrative, uh, you know, cartoons for this, uh, for this talk and I came across this very shortly after the earlier one. So it's exactly the same indication of a system. The only thing is that the salmon has been removed and a beaver has been put in its place. So in this particular person's uh, opinion, the, the, the beaver is a keystone species. The point being that the best way to find out about what, whether a species is keystone is to actually remove it from the system and observe what happens. But obviously we can't do that in most systems. So, um, so we sort of have to take these things as being very potential. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the keystone. I just wanted to bring it in as a concept. We're going to focus in on 
large carnivores, and we're going to focus in on um, the umbrella concept today. So obviously, in Sri Lanka, in the Sri Lankan context, we don't have lions, except for the flag and the beer bottles, I suppose. Um, but we do have the leopard, and obviously the leopard in Sri Lanka is the apex predator with, again, potential keystone value, we don't know. It is also definitely a flagship species within the country, together with the elephant. They're probably the most iconic of the species of, uh, within Sri Lanka's fa faunal assemblage. Um, and it has potential umbrella value, and so that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, when we look at, what I, the reason that it has strong umbrella potential is that it exists within all habitat types across all climatic zones within the country. This uh, map shows leopard occupancy, areas where leopards don't just uh, occur but are residing. And as you can see, they kind of, they, they cross all of the, the climatic zones within the country. So if you smooth that out a little bit and get a sort of a, an idea of leopard range as it's currently more or less understood within the country, you can see that again, it's covering the dry zone, the arid zone, the intermediate zone, upland, lowland, uh, wet zone, all of the zones that are within the country. So that makes it a potentially useful surrogate for the wider conservation of wider biodiversity. And that's not just me saying it. This has also been looked at more specifically. There was a, a, you know, a study that came out, which I'll talk about, um, that looked at the conservation value of all of the cats, of the 36 cat species in the world. And actually, the leopard is considered to be the, the best, the best uh, species for, as, to, that acts as an umbrella, in terms of acting as, um, as an umbrella to preserve and protect other cat species. Um, and part of that, like we saw in Sri Lanka, it's fairly wide range across different habitats. So globally, the leopard still has, although fairly fast diminishing, it still has a fairly wide range and encompasses habitats from dense rainforest to open savanna to arid areas and deserts even. Um, so that, that, that means that it actually overlaps with 20 other felid species in the world of the 36 and uh, increases its umbrella potential. So when I talked about that paper, this, uh, this is some of the results from that paper, which was basically ranking felid species from their global conservation priority. Um, and as you can see, the top six there that are highlighted were the ones that kind of came up um, as, as distinctly different from the rest and, and of higher conservation priority from this perspective. The tiger, the flat-headed cat, and the cheetah, now all of those are of high conservation priority based on their low numbers and the threats to them. Um, whereas the puma and the leopard, specifically the leopard, if you can see here, it has the highest umbrella score. So when you incorporate the umbrella score into um, the rest of the equation, it increases the conservation priority of the leopard dramatically. It moves it up 23 spots within the, 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 the global the ranking list um, and puts it a, as a high conservation priority because of its umbrella status. Now, this same paper also, this is some good news for Sri Lanka, which is some positive news, which is nice. Um, it also looked at the actual nations where these cats occur, um, and it ranked those nations in terms of their conservation priority as well as their conservation um, likelihood. So the conservation priority is the number of species of high conservation priority that are within the country, um, the networks, and then the conservation likelihood is more to do with the, the government, the social structure, the acceptance of conservation, the, 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 the likelihood that conser necessary conservation actions will actually happen in those countries. So you have some that, like you see in brown there, where you have a high conservation priority, yet a low conservation likelihood. Um, and those are some surprising places sometimes. You know, you get Argentina and Russia, Canada. Um, and so it's indicating that the likelihood of, of positive action is not great in those places for a number of reasons. I won't go into all the details of the study. Um, whereas Sri Lanka sits here in the, 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 the top right quadrant, which shows high conservation priority based on the four wildcat species that are here, but also a fairly high conservation likelihood, which is based on a strong conservation ethic within the country and some good laws and uh, regulations in place. So that's some positive news. Obviously, it's got to be, you know, we've got to keep pushing as society to make sure that, this, that these uh, actions occur. Um, but that's, a, that's definitely a positive sign. So getting back to our work here, um, did an analysis looking at leopard distribution, as it's, as, as it's known in Sri Lanka, 
and linking that to a number of factors which indicate or might have an influence on the suitability of habitat for leopards. So we looked at about 30, over 30 different variables in this way. It was a fairly involved study and uh, we tried to account for things like observer bias and tried to account for um, the spatial scale at which we were looking at some of these things. Um, and so when you look at the top ranking variables that came out, well, by far the, the, the most important was actually the level of protection of the landscape. So level one protection means national parks, strict natural reserves within the country. So that was very, even though we get leopards living outside of protected areas, and a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is about leopards outside of protected areas, um, the, one of the key suitability um, markers for the leopard in the country is actual habitat protection. And the next thing of, very, of high importance here is that the three out of the four next um, variables that you see there are all forest metrics. Now, I told you that we had about 31 different metrics we looked at. Only three of those were forest metrics, and all three of them rose up to the top, indicating the importance, obviously, of forest cover within the country for leopard persistence. Um, so protected areas and forest is kind of the take-home message from this. And if you, you know, I mean, this is just a graph to kind of illustrate those same points. If you look at, you know, as, as we increase the, the amount of protection of the landscape going from left to right, we increase the, the suitability of the habitat for, for the leopard. As we increase the patch size of the forest in question, we also increase the suitability of the habitat for the leopard. So that kind of leads us to, uh, to understand that a useful conservation direction is to focus on you know, these, uh, these forest areas and also connections between those forest areas where the leopard is, is going to move. And so if we can then work to preserve some of those connections that are currently unprotected to bring them into protected status, we have the potential also to, in a very Disney-esque way, um, increase the, 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 the protection for a host of other species that are also on the landscape. So that's, that's kind of what the way that we're, the direction that we're moving at the moment with leopard conservation. I'm going to switch over now. <laughs> 